Um, thank you very much, and thank you to the organizing committee for inviting me and my first time in Vienna, and uh, I'm enjoying it so, a lot so far, but I have a couple of days of seeing Vienna after this conference. Um, it's actually quite fitting to give this talk um, because this, this started as my first lecture to the second year of the Econ PhD program at, at um, Georgetown. Um, Econ PhD students all over the world have stopped, it seems, Econ students, I don't need to say PhD students, have stopped studying the history of economic thought. Um, I thought I would try to change that and um, introduce that history through the lens of poverty. Um, I'm not an expert in the history of economic thought. I learned a lot preparing this first, that first lecture for Georgetown. It turned into a long paper, and the long paper has turned into a long book. Uh, so it was a very productive first lecture. Um, my students... <laughs> My, my PhD students at Georgetown tell me it was the best, of the le best lecture of the entire course. So it, it went downhill from that point on. Anyway, it's a story. It's a story that I'm trying to fill in. Um, and I'm often, as I say, whenever I give this talk, I, uh, anybody got any bits of this puzzle they can help me with, please do so. Send me an email, tell me about it, because there's a puzzle. History of thought is a puzzle. You're trying to fill it in as best you can. And you're using unconventional tools, at least unconventional tools for an economist. It's a story with a cast of characters. This guy here is Cotillia, 300 BC, and I would argue the first economist. It's also got the English working class, very prominent in this story. Uh, how, how could Adam Smith not be prominent in the story? But also Figaro plays a role, uh, Pierre Beaumarchais, a famous play, um, Michael Harrington, The Other America, a book you're going to hear about, and of course Oliver Twist, uh, a host of characters. Um, the starting point is the realization that um, if in all of policy, if there's one thing I think we now have pretty clear, not universal, but overwhelming agreement on, it's three premises, um, and poverty is an area where there's a lot of agreement. Poverty is social bad, poverty can be eliminated, and public policies can help do that. That's the starting point for this lecture. What the lecture is about is how did we come to, to have those premises? Where did they come from? Did we always think this, or, or have the have views changed? I'm going to argue that there's been an enormous change in thinking in 200 years, and that was um, Enormous change in thinking. I can summarize it with a, a series of quotes. The first is from uh, Philippe Hiquet, a um, famous French doctor in um, the mid 18th uh, century, um, also a, um, a benefactor of charitable organizations. The poor are like the shadows in a painting, they provide the necessary contrast. A view of poor people is quite striking. Um, Arthur Young, um, a very famous, probably the most famous English uh, agronomist, also a, a statistician, early statistician, everyone but an idiot knows that the lowest classes must be kept poor or they'll never be industrious. Early, early awakening of the idea of income and substitution on their relative magnitudes. Uh, Alfred Marshall, uh, may we not outgrow the belief that poverty is necessary? A hundred years later, Alfred Marshall, the Alfred Marshall, I hope you've studied Alfred Marshall, or at least you've learned about consumer surplus and producer surplus and all of that, he had very progressive ideas about poverty and anti-poverty policy. hundred years later, uh, the motto of the World Bank, our dream is a world free of poverty, and the new president of the World Bank, or not so new now, and um, probably starting to wonder whether he made the right choice. Uh, is there anybody today who would not commit to eliminating poverty? I'm going to walk you through what I see as the story, as of the history of how best I understand it, but I'm also going to emphasize there are some, some continuing issues. It actually helps to start with a, of the model an expository model that, that helps lay out some, some basic ideas. And it's a very standard model now of wealth dynamics where we have a credit constraint, imperfect credit markets. You can't borrow more than, say, lambda times your wealth. Um, every person has a nice neoclassical production function. Uh, capital stock, which equates the marginal product of the capital to the rate of interest, all very conventional. But we're going to add to 
threshold capital stock, there's some minimum level of wealth you need to be productive in the future. Now here, by wealth, I'm going to define it as pretty much everything, human, non-human wealth. So you can think of this as schooling, your investment in human capital, but also physical capital. And the threshold effect may be um, uh, something to do with the property capital. You need a minimum level of, of capital to be productive, physical capital. It could be that you need a minimum level of schooling. To, to earn anything in the labor market. Now, your people here have invested a lot in schooling. Uh, it's not uh, a surprise to you to learn that uh, you're not going to get any inco income bump from just like one minute of schooling. There's some minimum critical level of schooling, uh, qu quite high level in, in rich countries, but it's even in poor countries it exists. So we can think of uh, the dynamics in, 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 in terms of multiple equilibria. This is a wealth diagram, wealth of team time, time t plus 1, wealth of time t. Uh, given this uh, lambda, this borrowing constraint that says you can only borrow lambda of your wealth, there's some critical level ab above which the the model. We've got this k-min, and we've got this concave segment here, the concavity determined by the shape of the, of the individual's own production function. And the reason it's curved in that interval is the borrowing constraint. You're, you're constrained by your own productive possibilities. Uh, we've got three equilibria here. The middle equilibria at B is unstable. A two stable equilibria. So this is a wealth poverty trap, a classic wealth poverty trap. We're going to think of poverty as people who are stuck at this point, or people who are at this steady state equilibrium, or on the way to that steady state equilibrium, but that's an individual recursion diagram. Your own steady state equilibrium at C may involve poverty. There's no reason why you There's two kinds of poverty here. Wealth poverty traps, poverty that could only be eliminated by a minimum increase in your wealth. Uh, the, just any small increase will not do it. And we've got also an, another form of poverty amongst people here. And the only way you get rid of that is by shifting this production function. Whereas to get rid of this, we're going to need to do other things. It's going to be much more than just shifting that production function. We're going to have to deal with the, the constraints that people uh, face in getting out of poverty. Uh, we're going to have two classes in the society. If I shake that economy enough, we're going to have people for in the, the working class at point A and other people at, say, point C. Um, we can also think of poverty without a wealth poverty trap. I emphasize that, and I've said that already, so moving on. Two types of policies here. We're going to think of protection policies as things that, whether you're at point A or point C, you've got some variability in your income, and you need help with consumption smoothing. So protection policies are going to be the things that governments do to help Maybe the things that either get you out of the wealth poverty trap or shift that production function to move you to a higher steady state level of wealth. One of those empty poverty policies is the combination of the two. And the question I'm asking you today is how do we come to combine the two? Uh, in fact, I'm going to policy that doesn't combine the two, I'm going to question, is it not going to be a comprehensive anti-poverty policy in the way I'm going to think about it today? The last 200 years have essentially seen a transition from an emphasis on, on only protection to an emphasis on protection and promotion. That's a big change. Protection has been around since at least Cotillia, since at least 300 BC. We've had protection policies, and I'll explain that. Promotion policies are much more recent and a much bigger innovation. It's really just the last. This, uh, the 20th century is the, the, the main period. OK, going back, I'm going to start the clock in the mercantilists in the, around the 16th to 18th century. The mercantilists were the first economists, in my reckoning, the first economic theorists. Cotillia was a theory of, of ends and means. The ends were the balance of trade, the idea of uh, the objectives of, anti of policy, or policy, was to maximize the country's balance of trade. Well, of course, the balance of trade is, is, is zero globally, so it's a kind of zero-sum game, and each country is, is fighting every other country. The means of achieving that end were cheap inputs, and of course, the most very important cheap input was labor. So the mercantilist logic was essentially you keep people poor, you keep wages low to increase your, your power in the world, to increase your balance of trade and the power of your, the regime. So poverty development. But poverty was not a, a bad thing. It was a good thing. In essence, poverty, 
Antler's thinking, price is needed, keep wages low, keep the balance of trade high. Utility of poverty, this is an expression from um, Furnace, things in, about economic history in the early 20th century. Uh, poverty was seen as essential for economic development. Uh, this quote from Joseph Townsend is, is, is indicative. The poor know little of the motives which stimulate the higher ranks to action, pride and ambition. In general, it is only hunger which can spur and go. So essentially, the foundation of this way of thinking was a negatively sloped labor supply schedule. Uh, higher wages meant workers went off. Lives on, on, on drink and, 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 and in some reckonings even worse than drink. Um, and it was a um, general presumption. And this was actually an official report in 1776 that I, I found on the thoughts on the present state. Before. Um, it is observable that where the highest wages are given, they do the least work, the rest of their money at the alehouse. Um, in this history of thought, Bernard de Mandeville plays a, an important role. Bernard de Mandeville, a philosopher, economist, and the in the early to mid 18th century, uh, de Mandeville had to, to modern eyes some really horrid ideas in his head. And um, the surest, this is a quote, the surest wealth consists in a magnitude, a multitude of laborious poor, and great numbers of them should be ignorant as well as poor. So it's spilled over into ideas about protection policy, but against protect, uh, promotion policy, sorry, against promotion policies. And the idea of promotion, the idea of schooling, getting out of poverty by investing here in capital was an anathema to, to people like uh, Bernard de Mandeville. Now, when we look at Mandeville, a quote like that, we often th we think in modern uh, eyes and we th our modern thinking, we think, God, how could he be so horrible? Uh, but maybe it makes a lot of sense. If that wealth poverty trap is the reality, and, and um, here you're talking about very poor economies, uh, Europe, North America, in the early, uh, late to 18th century, was as, uh, as poor as any of the poorest countries today. I'm going to actually show you, almost for the first time, some evidence, on new evidence on that. But um, very poor, so for, for a poor country, wealth poverty traps were probably pervasive. Uh, getting out of poverty with a small amount of schooling was just not on. You look at modern times now, uh, my favorite example of that when I was reading, in fact, the very same time I was reading Bernard de Mandeville, I was reading Catherine Boo, Behind the Beautiful Forevers. Has anybody read this book, Behind the Beautiful Forevers? Actually made it on the sort of New York Times bestseller list. Uh, Catherine Boo is a journalist for the New York Times, um, spent a year in a, a, a Mumbai slum. Um, There, trying to work out the lives and understand the lives of people in this slum. At one point, she talks about Sunil. Sunil is a, a 10 to 12 year old scavenger and lived entirely off scavenging, um, very poor. But Sunil was a very smart guy and he knew that education was one way of getting out of poverty. So he thought he'd try that. And he discovered the poverty trap. And, and Catherine Boo describes it. She's not, a, not an economist, no talk about dynamic re recursion diagrams or any of that stuff. But Sunil. Well, how am I going to get out of poverty with a little bit of schooling? I need a lot of schooling, and I'm going to be very hungry before I get a long, lot of schooling. In fact, that little bit of schooling is making him hungry because it's taking time away from, from scavenging. Uh, uh, the reason I... Is that, that's what he learned in his schooling. Wow. He learned this backwards, wrote learning after a week, and then he gave up his schooling. Okay, protection side of, of anti-poverty policy does in fact have a long history. Um, and poverty was seen as, as, as uh, caused by moral failings. This was transparently an excuse. I mean, the guilty con uh, poverty and, and, and they would excuse it and, and blame people for that poverty. It's something a lot more then. Um, poor utility, a propensity for alcoholism, um, all kinds of bad choices that people make. Um, so rich people, by and large, blame poor people for their poverty. Little scope for public action besides protection. And that was the period of slavery, feudalism, where we, the, 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 the keeping the worker alive was fully internalized by the property right. Essentially, you 
perspective to protect them. Once that changed, feudalism had disappeared in England by, by um, I guess, 14th, 15th century. It was pretty much on the way. Cotillia was writing, as I said, 300 BC, and was giving advice to kings of really just a, a policy craft. It's a policy wonk guide, everything you need to do um, if you're a, a ruler in India in the, in the 300 BC, and, and that included policy advice for protection. He was advocating workfare programs, and was the, one of the of explicit uh, protection policies. Um, systematic public protection policy under a, in a federal government. Um, what the government of England did essentially is say, the parishes have to look do it through their own means. So there was property redistribution within parishes all kinds of problems of horizontal equity, but it was essentially a legislated protection policy based on conditional cash transfers, conditional certain events in your lives, for example, ability, illness, unemployment, and so on. <laughs> Brief sketch of everything up to um, what was probably the most significant period in history of, of poverty thought. The, the first poverty enlightenment. That is my, what I call it. There are two poverty enlightenments in history. There's the first, they're going to get to the second. The first was in the latter part of the 18th century. It's a 20 year period from you know, 1780, 1775 to 1800, um, which is truly remarkable. I, and I didn't really know this until I started reading, but um, I found this, this wonderful series of. The History of Europe was done, a, a series of books was done in the 1930s, and they're, they're really nice. And, and it's the history of all of Europe. Um, it was like 10 volumes, I'm not sure, but you have one volume which is covering the entire Middle Ages. There's one volume just covering this 20-year period. There's just so much happening in, in, in thought. Of course, revolutions and wars. It was a period of rising poverty, but enormous changes in thinking changing popular attitudes as well as changes in philosophy. And we're going to summarize quickly what they were. Uh, popular attitudes were changing. The corresponding society was an example. A new questioning uh, of established social rank. The first time we started to see explicit questioning of rank, uh, questioning of the idea that poor people were, were, were fundamentally different and were, were inherently uh, um, a class. Of things, marriage of Figaro, as I mentioned, by famous uh, musical score by Mozart. But um, Parisian audiences were, were taking sides of the servants in, in thinking in the fifth act of, of Figaro's uh, of the marriage. What if to deserve such advantages? Put yourself to the trouble of being. Nothing more for the rest of very ordinary man. This was just extraordinary change. It was so much so that the, the, the play was banned by Louis the Sixteenth, and we all know what happened to him. And it was banned for for, for many years. Um, when it finally came out, it of all, all classes, except maybe the very rich, laughing their heads off at the aristocracy. Dramatic change. Jean-Jacques Rousseau um, came into the picture with the, his book, The uh, Discourse on the Origin of Inequality. The first, well, not the first, but a very serious thing of how inequality is some natural state, something that was just God-given, something you didn't ever question. He started to say, where did it come from? He went back to Hobbes, and people probably know Thomas Hobbes, the social contract theory, the early, with the earliest form of contract theory in philosophy. Essentially, Hobbes is asking the great counterfactual question, what is the impact of social organization? They asked, to answer that question, you've got to imagine the society without social organization. 
So it's a classic impact evaluation. That the counterfactual is the absence of all social organization. Hobbes regarded the world, said the world would just be this horrible state of civil war and, and people were inherently totally selfish and they would just destroy each other in the natural state. Rousseau's argument was empathy. He said that's not the case. People have a natural empathy. It's not the case that in the absence of social organization, people would not care about each other. So uh, Rousseau was, uh, Rousseau's answer to the uh, question, what is the impact of social organization? in part to social organization. He said that the natural state wasn't necessarily one of abilities that get produced by social organization that may not even exist in a natural organization. New attention to inequality. This was striking in, in, in French. Um, now, I haven't explained this diagram. Um, I showed you one already, but I wanted to delay talking about it. Um, does anybody know what that is, that diagram? It's from the Google Ngram viewer. Has anybody used that? OK, well, a lot of people here, if you're going to enter Google, go Ngram Viewer, you're going to waste a lot of time. <laughs> and I'm sorry. I've wasted a lot of time with this thing. What it is is an incredibly efficient way of reading 10 million books. All the digitized books, you're doing a search. For example, here I'm doing a search in, in the entire French digitized language. Poverty and inequality. Um, the striking thing here is look at the series for inequality. Dramatic increases in the, in the mid 1700s, late 1700s. And here's my, the series for poverty, the blue line here, spiking up enormously in their first poverty enlightenment. Um, in the English language, very different. Here's my first poverty enlightenment that I showed you already, the spike. Here on this axis, we have the percentage of all words in the digitized English language, the percentage of all words which are the word poverty. Spiking in here. But look, inequality, no sign. Dramatic difference in French and English literature. But in both of them, this big spike in interest in poverty around the first poverty enlightenment. I'm not identifying the first poverty enlightenment from the Google Engram but it certainly is helping me, supporting my, supporting my argument. We're going to come back to this second surge in both French and English, which is right now. The, second, the, the, the peak of incidence in the use of both, in both French and English of the word poverty is, is now. Um, although not the second poverty enlightenment. Now is the back. And both of these poverty enlightenments had a backlash. It was like two steps forward, one step back. We're in the one step back, but we have made two steps forward. Liberty, equality, and fraternity, the, 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 the French Revolution and the motto of, of, of France from about 100 years after the French Revolution, in the Declaration of the Rights of Man, the ideas of liberty, equality, and fraternity. Liberty and equality are exactly defined now the way they were defined in the Declaration. Fraternity is the thing that's different. Fraternity is something that wasn't really defined until John Rawls, in my view. So a very modern phenomenon. Fraternity is, a, is a, a totally fuzzy. I mean, everybody from Jeremy Bentham to Karl Marx would laugh at the rights of the man and the citizen somewhat after be, because of this fuzzy talk about rights. And the serious fuzziness is really in, in this idea of fraternity. So we, it was important that Rawls, 200 years later, was actually going to formalize the idea. But liberty and equality, liberty, it's essentially the modern use of liberty and distributive justice in political philosophy and in, and, um, in economics, in the idea of equality of opportunity. Uh, equality was, was essentially that, equality of opportunity. All citizens being equal in, its eye, in the eyes of the law, and they should be equal and eligible to high offices. Essentially, the motive, my reading of the motivation of this, it was a class, not poor people, it was a middle class who were seeing a kind of glass ceiling in, in, in French and throughout uh, um, uh, what is now the rich world, were seeing a glass ceiling where they couldn't get into jobs because they weren't, um, uh, they weren't born into the right families, uh, so attempt to liberate um, to create the opportunities for, for them. And I think that was the lasting legacy of, of this period. Adam Smith, well, the wealth of nations, you probably don't think of. 
in this way, but my interpretation now of the wealth of nations is essentially a rejection of mercantilism, a critique of the one really dangerous thing in mercantilism, equating the balance of trade with social welfare. Now, to a modern economist, that doesn't make any sense. Do you equate the balance of trade with social welfare? But the mercantilists argued that. And Smith said, we need a composite, and essentially Smith is saying we need a, a, more broad, a broader concept of social welfare. Smith even was so radical as to say that that could include the consumption of poor people, the consumption of necessities, as well as luxuries. He had a much more comprehensive view of how we should think about it, social welfare uh, as an economist. And progressive in many respects. And a, a rereading, for me, a rereading of The Wealth of Nations tells me that you know, Adam Smith has been tarred with a brush of, of, of uh, what we would call a word what you would call neoliberalism, but actually he was an amazingly progressive guy. Immanuel Kant, extremely important in this history, because I don't think it wasn't for Immanuel Kant. Prior to that, I don't think anybody was actually saying that, seriously saying, that poor people deserve the moral respect, the same moral respect as rich people. And that's a huge, it's a really significant step. Without that step in of morals, um, I don't think you could make all the subsequent steps in thinking about anti-poverty policy. You needed a Kantian perspective, which essentially said that we have to treat poor people with respect. They were people. And they were important to the development and subsequent development of, of suffrage. It took before we had universal male suffrage, but it was broad, it was part of a process toward that, that end. A lot of things in Kant that I, I, didn't, I didn't know about, um, but one is his views on charity. Now, prior to charity, essentially, um, you used the church, for example, the, the English poor laws relying on the parishes, but the, more generally, uh, beneficence, the, the, the giving of, of charity to poor people by rich people, there was any redistribution at all. And Kant was very remarkable on this. He asked, well, essentially, can we not look for a more respectful relationship between rich people and poor people? To Kant, the idea of, the, of, of this being redistribution was, was questionable because rich people were gaining from this. They were gaining the pride of being the donor, the power that came with the, do, the privilege of the donor. And he asked that, that redistribution should be anonymous, open to gain, the, the, the door to the idea that the state would play a role in achieving a more respectful and poor people, even if both remained, that the relationship was. The quality of what in all of this? It's very much a quality of opportunities. In economics, and if you study inequality, you, you typically start with the inequality of results. We think about everybody does inequality of results, and you think about social, nice quasi-concave social welfare functions in income, and you talk about income inequality penalizing as a, a negative in social welfare. All of that is inequality of results. We think of inequality opportunity as the, the sort of economics of inequality 601, not 101. But in fact, in the history of thought, equality of opportunity was the starting point. Very little discussion of inequality of results. Um, in fact, this guy, this handsome fellow here, is, is, is um, Gracious uh, famous in, in French history as uh, the, the f considered the first person to think in a way that was to become, come to be called communism. Enormously influential in the, in the left and the development of the socialist. Just asking for, let's talk about inequality of, of outcomes as well as opportunity. Things like progressive income taxation. He was, a, he was and was uh, guillotined for economy could actually be important for social welfare, including also uh, uh, certainly a view that came out of the poverty enlightenment. Crucial in this. The classical economist as a whole, though, Smith here was a little bit of an exception. The first of the great classical economists, um, Smith was, was a bit of an exception. The bulk of the classical economics, David Ricardo, Malthus, uh, 
economy. They would like to organize that economy. They'd like to see the freer trade and so on. But they were very skeptical of the idea that that economy could be good for poor people. That skepticism was a huge deb a debate that still goes on on whether the Industrial Revolution in England helped. My best synthesize that debate in the, in the paper book. The bottom line conclusion I've come to is that the, the Industrial Revolution did help poor people. A lot of that literature has had the wrong counterfactual. It's a literature, including, which is completely genuine, but thinking about the industrial with the wrong counterfactual. Poor people and seeing that they are poor relative to the living standards of rich people, not relative to the alternative for poor people at the time, which was agriculture. Wrong counterfactual, but also they didn't. We now got a lot more data. They were skeptical about the idea that the economy would ever help poor people. How do you help them? Well, their moral restraint is still going to be the first thing that matters. Moral, you've got to, but, the, but how do you get that moral restraint? Education. So we started to get a discussion, particularly in people, amongst people like Bentham and John Stuart Mill, a discussion, and, and Smith about education as a means of influencing behavior, achieving better behaviors by poor people, but still fundamentally premised on the view that poverty was about their behavior. It wasn't about the constraints they faced. It wasn't about poverty traps stemming from market failures. It was ultimately still blaming poor people for their poverty. The optimism and pessimism in the Industrial Revolution. Um, here's the picture. This is something that a picture I could have done. I've, I've used a lot of archival data. On the, on, the, uh, on the vertical axis here, I have the poverty rate. I've used a, a dollar a day. So I'm using a, a, a poverty line, which would be considered a, a, a low poverty line, a, a, a typical poverty line in poor countries. A dollar a day is, is exactly that, roughly the average poverty line of the poorest countries. I don't recommend you do this kind of work. Get tenure first. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to make so many assumptions. But you have to trust me on this. <laughs> Vertical axis, poverty rate. Here I have, I've tried to work it out. This is for the world as a whole. I'm relying heavily on, on Bourguignon Morrison's work, who are relying, well, in turn relying heavily on me. We've all been helping each other over the years. In, in trying to put together the data to do this. Um, but tremendous uncertainty. I, I, I don't know how he'd ever work out the conference interval around this. I mean, I have no idea. Uh, but it'd be extremely difficult. Um, but but you know, tremendous uncertainty of going back in time, more certainty back here. We get into the observations around here. We're talking about you know, enormous precision, in my view. We're talking about you know, essentially samples of two million households or so on. But here we're talking about so uh, great uncertainty. But declining poverty in the world as a whole. But my, the reason I'm doing this diagram is to answer the question, just how poor were the rich countries of today at the time of the Industrial Revolution? And from, I, can, I can't go back before 1820. So how, were they as, anywhere as poor as, say, the poorest countries today? And the answer is yes. These are poverty rates. They're clocking poverty rates in the US, a bit over 40%. In 1820, 40% of the population living below a dollar a day. That would make the US in 1820, if that was a country now, you'd be, you'd be, in, you'd be eligible for IDA, concessional lending from the World Bank. You'd be, you know, you, you'd be on, the, on the list of you know, high poverty countries uh, deserving special treatment. Um, the UK and Ireland, uh, you know, lower poverty rates in those two, two countries are two composite countries. Um, Japan and Russia, slower progress, bang. But look at the, and, and all we have here, I've got France and Germany, whatever I can put together here, dramatic reductions in, in extreme absolute poverty during the 19th century. So if anything speaks to this debate about whether the poor could benefit from the Industrial Revolution, I think it's these numbers. It's clear that uh, a lot of poverty reduction occurred in that period. If anybody, has anybody read um, Thomas Piketty's book, Capital in the 21st Century? Okay, well, 
If you haven't read it, you're one of the few people on the planet, it seems. It's amazing. It's now New York Times bestseller. Um, and for an economics book, a dry, big, fat economics book, um, to have this amount of readership is extraordinary. But one of the interesting things in Piketty's book is the identification of a return to the kind of inequality in the world, the, in the rich world really, in the rich world, the kind of inequality that we hadn't seen since prior to the First World War. But the interesting thing that Piketty doesn't say, Tom R. just talks about the high end of the distribution. He's the Mr. 1%. In fact, more than anybody, he's attracted scholarly attention and popular attention to the rising living areas of the richest 1% in the world. What he doesn't point out is that that period prior to the First World War, that period of great rising inequality associated with capital appreciation and high returns to capital relative to the economic growth, that period, rate of economic growth, that period was also one of dramatically falling. Think about the current period of rising inequality in the rich world and rising returns to capital and a high, well, actually, very high return to capital relative to the rate of growth. The interesting thing about this period is poverty is not falling. Absolute poverty is not falling in the US. It's not falling throughout most of Europe. And that's the big difference between the, those first and second periods. OK, um, moving on. The big debates here were reforms to poor laws. And this is the, the first social, big social policy debate about the word targeting. Targeting appeared. You read the debates about the reform laws, the, the poor laws, and the, and the incentive concerns. Uh, uh, labor supply responses, uh, even worries about savings responses to, to anti-poverty relief, uh, essentially driven by the politics. Um, remember, the parishes were financing the, the poor laws, and they had to do that through internal redistribution. And the only people with any money were the ones with property. So essentially, the landlords were financing the uh, redistribution through the poor laws. The cost had risen. It rose to about 2.5% of England's GDP. Um, massive uh, um, political opposition, an attempt to bring down that percentage. And the best tool they could find to do that was the workhouses. Now, the workhouses had been around for a while. The workhouses were an attempt, essentially, to use incentives to make sure that non-poor people didn't get relief from the poor laws, but essentially also to make sure to just reduce the number of people getting relief, to reduce the cost from, it turned out, 2.5% of GDP to 1% of GDP in about five years. So a dramatic change in social policy. When I talk about two steps forward and one step back, this was one step back. We made two steps forward, uh, but um, the one step back was the reforms to the poor laws, and essentially driven by politics. But economists were helping. David Ricardo, some as economists, and somebody who was really a founding father of of the study of income distribution. Um, David Ricardo made what is surely the greatest exaggeration any economist has ever made in this quote. It is quite, and this is from Principles, his book, it is quite in the nature of the order, natural order of things that the fund for the maintenance of the poor should, be, should progressively increase until it has absorbed all the net revenue of the country. He's getting that argument from Labor supply elasticities, you never even imagined. I mean, I, I don't think he thought it out, but you know, to get that kind of incentive, of adverse incentive effect, so that essentially the poor laws would attract so many people onto their register that the cost of the poor laws would rise to, to be the net revenue of the country is quite extraordinary. Targeting through workhouses, massive contraction in, the, in, the, in relief. Right I, I, I'm, I'm actually quite critical of targeting as an instrument for public. Debate was happening then too. When I read this literature, I hear things that are exactly the same as the debates we're having across the world today, and we've been having in the last 20 years or so, 20, 30 years, about targeting, the use of incentive instruments or screening instruments to try to uh, target, concentrate benefits on poor people and exclude non people Well, clearly it was a lot of poor people. Essentially, they so stigmatized and so they made poverty, so essentially criminalized poverty. They forced you to live in a workhouse where you would get your, 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 your sustenance, you would often be separated from your family, so you controlled poor people. Obviously, that was so 
stigmatizing and so objectionable, many poor people just turned away from public. Although we don't have anything as objectionable as the workhouses, we still have the same operating in social policy in a lot of places. But, but the uh, criticisms of the workhouses were, were really apparent. I mean, for example, Charles Dickens in the opening chapters of Oliver Twist, this is the cutest picture of Oliver Twist I could find. Um, but also on, on, on the right, I write, uh, Benjamin Disraeli. Benjamin Disraeli, the, the Prime Minister of, uh, of England, criticizing the workhouses on, on social grounds. So essentially, the news here is that targeting federalism is, 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 is not new. It was around at the time, and it was um, brought out essentially for the same political reasons, in my view, that targeting is often supported today. Not always, but, but often. Incentives and redistribution were, were an important theme 200 years ago. Lots of talk about incentives, same talk today. Much less information than today. They really didn't have any data. Um, now, today you hear a lot of people moaning about incentive effects of anti-poverty policy. When we have a lot of data, they're just ignoring it. We have a lot of data now on labor supply responses. We can talk credibly about incentives, and we know incentive effects are you ignore, you're crazy to ignore policy. But it, the exaggeration of the importance of incentive effects is what is distinctive here. Promotional policy in the 19th century, uh, and in all this reading, the beginning of the idea that poverty was not just bad, a rejection of the idea that poverty was necessary for economic development, but the beginning of the idea that poverty impeded economic development, that poverty and inequality were bad for economic growth and development in general. And it's in, in, this is captured nicely in this quote. And so Alfred Marshall is pleading, cannot we outgrow the belief that poverty is necessary? In this quote, the inequalities of wealth, and especially the very low earnings of the poorest classes, are dwarfing activities as well as curtailing the satisfaction of wants. So satisfaction of wants here is a reference to utilitarianism. But it's this bit, dwarfing activities. He didn't develop the argument at all and it took 100 years before the economics was actually well formed in a series of papers on economics and inequality in the mid-1990s that I'm going to come back to. But it was a big... And that's going to be important to this story. Empirical research was emerging. Um, this is another big change we had from around the middle of the 19th century. We started to see empirical observation of poor people's lives careful studies, but not really careful till we came to these two characters, Charles Booth and Shibam Roundtree. Now, Roundtree, everybody heard of Roundtree's chocolates? You know York's peppermint patty? Anyway, this is Roundtree, all from Roundtree. Roundtree was a chocolate factory owner. He created a, built a chocolate factory in York in the late 19th century. And he was a, you know, I think he sounds like he was a nice guy, actually. Even, anyway, he was as a factory owner, he was being criticized in the York newspapers for the low living standards of his workers. And he says, this can't be. I, I pay them. What, how do you mean? What do, so he went and did a survey. He actually did a proper survey of living standards of his workers, and he came back to the conclusion, yes, they're very poor. <laughs> Another character, Charles Booth, did a much more, I think, much more careful survey and, and had a whole team of people and... Um, his re one of his research assistants was Beatrice Webb, who went on to found the, uh, the London School of Economics and the empirical observation, careful documentation of budgets, what people spent their money on, what their income sources were, and so on. That's all archived and digitized in a, a, a wonderful archive at the London School of Economics, which you can access. Um, and it's, there's some nice stuff there. But this was really influential in, in, in social policy in important ways. I mean, Charles Booth's poverty measures for, for London, he calculated 30% of, of the London population around the 1890s lived below the poverty line. I've actually gone through to work out what it was worth. Easy to do, but I can, I can give you very plausible preferences for which Charles Booth's poverty line in 1890 was on the same, uh, same difference curve as India's poverty line in 1990. 
I can't say it's, it's not the same poverty bundle at all. It's very different. But it's believable. I can, I can at least imagine plausible preferences for which... Uh, it's in other words, India's population would have been, oh, sorry, or by the standard, by Indian standards a hundred years later. Um, the first emergence of poverty as a, as a metric of social progress, I have early indications of that in Arthur Bowley. You may have heard of Bowley as one of the founders of, of, um, of the of statistical inference based on surveys. He was uh, the first professor of statistics at the London School of Economics, and Bowley was, oh, you know, along with Fisher later and, uh, and Neumann, was, was, was begin the beginning of the discussion of how to do, do systematic inference from random samples based on surveys. Um, and Bowley also advocating the use of poverty as a measure of social progress. Um, sample surveys emerging, the statistics was emerging at the same time. Actually, the statistics was, the, the theory was lagging a long time from the practice. I mean, purposive sa sampling was around for a long time, and purposive sampling was quite popular. But random samples, uh, that was a radical idea, and uh, it was well developed in a famous paper by uh, Jersey um, Nyman, Nyman, and um, advocating the theory of inference based on sampling. But it was a long time before it went into, into practice. And certainly Booth had not done any random sampling. He was doing purposive sampling, trying to basically get a representative sample without randomization. But that was an important step. On mass schooling, these debates were emerging. What was striking to me is the realization that um, that um, the debate on schooling, like the idea of compulsory schooling, how long did that take, bans on child labor, that debate was going on for at least 100 years before the policy reforms occurred. For example, sub, uh, subsidized bursaries for poor students in Adam Smith, 120 years before the legislation and before the policy changes. Um, lots of um, early indications and lots of discussion, but also a political debate. For example, uh, industrialists were set against and were lobbying heavily against bans on child labor. No surprise. Working class kids were going to school from the, were, sorry, were not going to school. Working class kids were typically in the workforce at the age of seven. of the idea of, 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 a, of, a, of a ban on child labor or compulsory schooling. And that switched. At some point in the late 19th century, industrialists started to switch. And obviously, technology had changed. The skill demands had changed. And the industrialists started to realize they needed more skilled workers. I don't believe the, the kind of Marxian argument that in education is that that change was all driven by the needs of industry. I don't believe that. And partly, I don't believe it because when the, at, the, at the historical record, the advocates were not so much the advocates of this change, this toward compulsory schooling in, in the rich were, were very broad in society, certainly not industrious. And the places where it appeared were not industrial centers initially. Uh, so there's a lot, lot going on beside uh, the needs of industrial capitalism. Targeted tuition subsidies are important. Um, set of uh, policy tools. Again, Adam Smith was an early advocate. And that went through an evolution. Interesting things. Um, fame, Australia's bursary program in the 60s, uh, we had a whole series of, of innovations which have led up to what are now called conditional cash transfers, transfers that are conditional on behavioral responses uh, in, in, in the in, um, in, rich, in, in, sorry, in the developing world today, and this has been an explosion of interest. But still that behaviorism is underlying it. There's often a presumption that it's behavior of poor people that is still at fault, but in a, still a much more progressive and, and promotional anti policy. Second big state change. In the period from 1960 to 1980, Enlightenment. And here in the, in the, in the literature, and we, we see a dramatic change. But, but in poverty numbers, I've given you, again, back to the previously, percentage of people below the poverty line, over time, the striking thing you probably didn't notice in the previous picture, but is evident here, is the change around this time. 
we went on to a new trajectory in poverty reduction. If you think of this as a structural break test, then we're talking about one point, an extra 1.5 billion people would have been poor by this very low standard if not for that change that occurred sometime after 1950, a change in trajectory. Now, I don't believe the change in thinking produced that. The change in thinking a dramatic change. And of course, higher rates of economic growth were part of that, but also they were produced in turn by similar sorts of changes in thinking and changes in, in policy. Um, what were the, the, the big things in terms of thought? I, I guess two books stand out. The, um, uh, John Kenneth uh, uh, Galbraith, The Affluent Society. And I think uh, probably even more important than that book, Michael Harrington's The Other America. Um, I had read this book back in a long time ago, um, and I reread it for this. It's a, quite a short book. But basically, it's a... a shock. The 19, um, at this time, and then very complacent America, booming economy, out of the Second World, World War, faster growth, lots of, of optimism, lots of hope. And suddenly this book appears, it's describing poverty in America. And people were just shocked. They didn't know. And it's exactly the same reaction in the, 19, in the 1890s. It fueled policy response. Charles Booth, a modern president in Britain, including the introduction of years after his book first appeared. Similarly, John Can uh, both Galbraith, but um, particularly Michael Harrington, they stimulated policy. So essentially, this was research fueling policy in a big way. The policy we're talking about poverty, um, Kennedy initially, and then Johnson. Um, were very influenced by, by the, the message from, from this book. One indication, I, I went to figure out, I was trying to figure, was, was the other America such a surprise? Well, one way I thought of doing that is look at the print runs. I uh, too long. I think it went up to uh, 1.8. Huge, huge success. Um, in economics, the resurrection of inter interpersonal comparisons, for some reason it's still a mystery to me. The, the, uh, Pareto's ideas on the idea of developing economics without interpersonal comparisons and utility was, had a lot of influence in the period from about 1914 to 1950. Economists trying to do, uh, talk about policy with may, out making interpersonal comparisons of welfare. And of course, that neutralized their ability to influence policy in, across a wide range of areas. It's very hard to talk about anti-poverty policy or redistribu redistributive policy without making interpersonal comparisons of welfare. So we needed, in a sense, people like Ken Arrow and others who were starting to just rock the boat quite, not, not so gently, for parity and welfare economics. Rigorous formulations of incentive constraints. I think here that uh, the contribution of well, this is basically formalizing ideas about incentives and the idea of uh, equity efficiency trade-off associated with incentives, which were in classical economics, which were way back in the debates about the poor laws, but he's formalizing it in a very careful way. And then we had some, uh, a lot of work in labor economics trying to put some numbers on some of the key elasticities in, in a Murley's type framework, and also trying to look at non-utilitarian objectives. The rejection of utilitarianism by at least some economists and certainly by many philosophers, is largely due to probably the single most important book of the Second Poverty Enlightenment, The Theory of Justice by John Rawls. This was really the first time we had a, a clear, clear formulation of the idea of fraternity, which Rawls interpreted as the difference principle, the idea that we accept inequality if, only if the poor benefit. It's so actually from a Rawls, going back to Piketty, from a Rawlsian perspective, the period of the, of the of rise of high inequality in the, in the rich world prior to the First World War, the period that we've returned to, sadly, that period of falling poverty was, would have been acceptable to Rawls by the difference principle. The current period would not have been acceptable uh, to Rawls. 
This was influential in many ways. We had a, a rigorous non-utilitarian formulation for thinking about the, the justice of institutions based on, the, on, on judged against the welfare of the least advantaged. We had a rigorous way of thinking about equity. For Rawls, Rawls is not a, a Rawls is thought of as, as, a, as a philosopher of the left, I guess, but he's really not a, 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 a rabid egalitarian. Rawls was very happy to have inequality, as I said, if it satisfied the difference principle. He's happy to have all the inequality. If the rich is 1%, it's growing at, at, the, at an enormous rate, that's fine, as long as you can demonstrate that the poor are benefiting. If they're not, then it's objectionable. Um, further, further to this, the reinterpretation of fraternity was important. And, um, and this is really, a, as I've emphasized, an important contribution. We had an explosion of interest, attention to poverty post 1960, and here back to the Ingram viewer, this could hardly, look at this, I've just plotted a bunch of things here, poverty line, poverty rate, poverty gap, Gini, Lorenz curve, household survey, uh, you're a massive explosion from this period, so you see, uh, and tapering it off, but, but and then in policy, um, anti-poverty, poverty alleviation, redistribution of wealth, and so on. Uh, the, uh, the digi so that, and again, there's a percentage of, of all words or all n-grams, a fancy way of saying a phrase, in, in the Google n-gram viewer. New knowledge about poor people, again, was very important to all of this. Um, new efforts in surveying, things like the National Sample Survey in, in India, uh, essentially started by a, a famous Indian stat statistician, Mal Nervous, um, who was following very much and influenced by Fisher, and Fisher was um, also involved in, in, in work in India at that time. Uh, the World Bank with its uh, living standards measurement surveys and so on. Um, all of this was echoing essentially Booth and Roundtree, the same story, using a rigorous observation, but with new tools, much better tools and statistics that allowed uh, facilitated inference and the development of, of microeconometrics from uh, a bit later was also facilitating this. Again, just like in the first poverty enlightenment, we had a series of backlashes, just like the critique of, say, David Ricardo in the first, po in the, uh, for the old poor laws, we had arguments against uh, the, the new poor law, new new poor laws of the emerging the welfare states of, of, of rich countries. Arguments like Charles Murray in the in the, uh, the book Losing Ground. Um, yeah, and, and again, just like in the previous in previous times, we had a poorly informed policy discussion. But this time, we couldn't. We knew it was poorly informed. People like Elwood and Summers, that's Larry Summers, critiquing some of this, just pointing out that the evidence and the theory were not consistent with the policy positions. Incentives mattered, but they were not nearly as important to anti poverty to the impacts of anti poverty policy as people. Poverty in, in, in post-independence uh, developing world. I'm going to be very quick about this, but um, through a, bit after, a bit after the beginning of the first poverty enlightenment, well, really, no, right from the beginning of the first poverty enlightenment, we had the West discovery of poverty in, in the developing world. Now, this was, no, this was well known in the developing world, so that wasn't exactly um, uh, breathtaking new knowledge, but it produced a whole series of, of efforts in anti-poverty policy the newly independent developing countries across the board were really committed to fighting poverty. They just didn't know how to do it. And they had a whole lot of policies based on trade biases, for example, against, which ended up being trade biases, biases against poor people often. A whole lot of policy was essentially ineffective against poverty in the early post-independence periods. Frustrated anti-poverty plans galore and all kinds of uncertainties and change are developing out of that. There was the, one, the one region that was showing progress right from the start was East Asia. East Asia's success was not, categorically not due to Washington consensus type policies. It wasn't due to um, the so-called neoliberal policy agenda. It wasn't, uh, they were just as interventionist and just had, their, a lot of their policies were just as silly as the second plan in India. Yeah, it, was, it was just as failed as a policy regime the big difference was their distributional policy. And this is really striking. Every one of the countries in these successful East Asian countries had radical redistributive land reforms in various forms, public support for human capital formation, public investment in agriculture, an early emphasis on agriculture. Emphasis in agriculture, Sub-Saharan Africa is neglecting agriculture, never made that first step, labor augmenting technical programs 
East Asia had been doing right from the start. Generally sensible poorer programs, and on top of all of this, very capable states. And, and that was after the first part of the Enlightenment, or starting to in the period from the 70s and the 1980s, the rebalancing and emphasis on rural development, starting essentially with Robert McNamara's Nairobi speech, but um, McNamara, who was then the, the president of the World Bank, but, but, but um, was obviously basing it on a groundswell of thought and, and concern about the urban biases in policy making, the biases in capital towards capital intensive sectors, for example, the, as, as in the second plan in India. All of those biases against poor people were starting to be exposed. The second rebalancing was in human development, a uh, big important change in my view of Amartya Sen's critique of roles, um, very much the idea of uh, rejecting roles concept of primary goods as a basis for judging welfare and looking for something broader um, that essentially recognized that two people with the same income can have very different levels of welfare. Um, I think in some ways that was a bit exaggerated. I, I think Rawls was fully capable of absorbing the capabilities approach well, pretty close to it. But nonetheless, a bit of intellectual product differentiation always helps. Uh, some exaggerated efforts of product differentiation between the international organizations, which uh, maybe didn't help that much. But certainly a new international commitment, the Millennium Development Goals, and now the post-2015 agenda. Finally, this is the end of the story, or the end of the story for now, the final blow to the idea of the utility of poverty. And I think that final blow occurred in the aftermath of the first, second poverty enlightenment, occurred from the mid-1990s when people started to formalize the various ways in which inequality was bad for economic growth. Now at the time, if you'd asked any development economist, or well, almost any, I wouldn't have given you this answer, but, but many development economists would have said, oh, inequality is something that's, that's generally good for economic growth. You've got to put up with rising inequality in the early stages of development in a poor country. It's more or less inevitable. And that was a tradition coming from um, Arthur Lewis, uh, Simon Kuznets, and others. Um, and it was uh, basically it said, don't worry. Inequality problems will eventually solve themselves. Just focus on economic growth. Realization came with better data, all of that surveys data that I talked about, and people started to realize that very few Lewis were, were elegant theoretically, but this weren't fit. Similarly, a lot of the new development thinking that emerged around the realization of the many ways in which market failures, government failures, could mean that inequality was actually bad for economic growth, not good for economic growth. A whole series of arguments in, 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 in chapter two. But here Keynes was thinking purely of, a, of, a, of an economy which is with a lack of an effective demand. The new arguments that appeared in the 1990s were distinctive in that they would also hold in a fully employed economy, resting heavily on political economy, borrowing constraints, and so on. A lot of evidence on this and a host of, of papers, I just list some of them there, um, and some new research from the IMF is getting more publicity than it really deserves, but, it, but the fact that the IMF is now saying, at least the research department of the IMF is now saying things that the research department of the World Bank had been saying 15 years earlier, that inequality is bad for economic growth, and we have to really seriously worry about high inequality as an impediment to growth and development. All kinds of ways in which redistribution may, may, or, uh, impede economic growth, but you'd have to have massive redistribution efforts, probably at the extreme of any efforts we've ever seen. So as long as you don't go the road of Cuba, you're going to re if, you, if you're just talking about moderate redistributive policy, we can start to see it actually as positive or at least benign from the point of view of economic growth. Final step, though, is really, is it inequality or poverty? Remember, the po utility of poverty idea was that poverty itself is good for economic development. We now have new arguments, and very recently, and here I'm quoting my own work, um, really showing us that inequality, it's not poverty, it's inequality. Here's a simple regression of growth rates on, uh, of, of incomes in developing countries. On the right-hand side, you have the initial income, so it's a classic growth regression, something I, I promised once I would never, ever do, but... <laughs> 
I did it for you here. A classic growth regression. On the right-hand side, initial income. On, you know, everything's totally classic. Uh, but I put a poverty measure, initial poverty measure on the right-hand side, and those are T-ratios. And you may say to me, oh, it's just the poverty measure is picking up inequality. Well, it's not. And here's an encompassing regression. Which I, I threw in everything else I could possibly imagine on inequality that people talked about in the literature. Share of middle class, Gini index, all the things that people have written about. Poverty kills all of them, pretty much. It's not inequality that is bad for economic growth in poor countries. It's poverty itself. And that poverty impedes poverty development, the reduction of poverty. So poverty persists, two reasons. Poorer countries have lower rates of growth, but yet they need even higher rates of growth to achieve the same impact on poverty of a given rate of growth. Two things then. Poverty, I'm going to repeat that, poverty impedes growth in poor countries and it makes it harder to get poverty reduction out of economic growth. And the two things are present. OK, so we've gone essentially full circle. We've come back to a view now. We've now we've not full circle. We've come from 180 degrees rather than 360 degrees. We're now in a position to say that poverty is instrumentally bad for economic development. It's not instrumentally good. Final comments, concluding comments. Why did we see this transition? And what does it tell us about going forward? My own take on this is that we essentially, political economy is driving a lot of the thinking. It's not so much the other way around. The political economy in the, in 200 years ago was, was dealing with very, very poor countries, as I've, I've shown you. The idea of promotional anti-poverty policy really would have been heavy lifting. You may not agree with de Mandeville's ideas now, but there's an element of truth. If you were talking about that amount of poverty in, in those settings, the idea of promotional anti-poverty policy was a heavy, really heavy lifting. This would have required major, major changes. Um, the political economy was clearly going to resist that, no question. When did we change to a pr pr promotional policies, and when did they start to succeed? Once that heavy lifting had been done. Essentially, once we started to see through technological change, through industrial revolutions, through the changes in, through higher rates of growth, we started to see falling poverty measures, we started to see an acceleration, and we started to see the promotion of policies which would, in, would assist that acceleration. So essentially, we accelerated out, and we're doing that right now, accelerating out of extreme poverty in the world. It's disappeared from the rich world. It's still very present in the poor world. But we're seeing rates of poverty reduction now, which we've never seen before. And it's not just China. We're seeing it across the board, including in sub-Saharan Africa. So we see, we're seeing hope here. We're seeing the potential for an acceleration. The problem with moving between those two equilibria, the protection-only equilibrium to the protection plus promotion equilibrium, is a big step. It takes a lot of heavy lifting. And it's achieved through largely through, in my view, economic growth. But facilitated by policies, which also starts to develop better policies through a, a, a virtuous cycle. Um, what then, looking forward? Well, we've got clearly two possibilities going forward. We can, we can get rid of extreme poverty. On this trajectory, we, we're going to uh, get rid of, uh, we'll bring the extreme, the, this poverty rate down to 3% by 2030. But of course, you know, how do we maintain that trajectory? And how do we prevent falling back to this trajectory? Well, by a lot of hard work and a lot of work on both um, growth and redistribution policies across the world. I think we can do it more than any time before. I think we really can virtually eliminate extreme poverty in the world. That would be just one step, but surely a very important step. But I wouldn't be very certain that we won't also have another backlash against that objective. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. So we have room for questions. Are there any? <laughs> You're tired. Thank you very much for the inspiring talk. I have one question which is kind of, I think, related to what you mentioned in the end. Uh, at least to me, it feels that in the current situation, we talk a lot of 
inequality, but what you mentioned in the beginning, it's also about equality of chances. So I think could like social mobility be the missing link in all that picture? Because as you say, poverty seems to be the decisive factor and poverty is a consistent thing, whereas inequality can be changing over time and then doesn't necessarily have to be bad. So what's your thought on that? Um, well, I agree. At this point, has been to argue that we should not have an explicit inequality goal post 2015. You know, now I'm, I've, I'm, I'm, this is regarded for, you know, I get critics on the whole slew of critics on this, and everybody thinks it's uh, being nasty right wing rebellion again or something. Or, you know, I don't think I'm particularly right wing. It's just that I don't, inequality is, is exactly one of those things where I don't know. In a, it's not like infant mortality. <laughs> infant mortality, we do want to go to zero. Inequality is not something we want to go to zero. I don't see any moral or economic argument which would support that, that view. So the idea that we have a goal of eliminating inequality or bring it down to some level, I have absolutely no idea. But I do think we have shared goals about poverty and mobility, and certainly is one of them. And, and I'd argue that a lot of the concern, those concerns are fundamentally about mobility, about people's opportunities in life. So I agree. So with um, inequality, um, I agree it's hard to agree on a goal. Um, we have to reach this type of, uh, this um, level of inequality. But uh, before then, we'd have to define what inequality is. it wealth? Is it income? There's so many different ones. Mm -hmm. And we'd have to measure them yeah. before we can see anything. And I think... We could use um, inequality to, if we if we measure it to an extent, extent um, to I don't know how to put it uh, to find more information on poverty and to do do more work in that direction and that would be quite a goal I think. Okay, but but. The question here is, do you care about inequality independently of, say, poverty and human development? So our current goals in development, it could be summarized in that expression, poverty reduction and human development. The issue is, do we have an independent role for inequality? I'm not I'm entirely in favor of measuring inequality, and I regard it as instrumentally important, crucial to progress in both poverty and human development. But they are the goals. What I'm saying is that inequality doesn't have independent status as a goal. It is instrumentally important. Now, many very important things in the world are instrumentally important to something else. So the fact that I say that doesn't mean I think inequality is unimportant or we shouldn't measure it. Of course, we should. But in thinking about our goals, just like the mercantilist and Adam Smith and the history of economics in general, I think we've always got to think of our goals in some defensible concept of social welfare. I'm not a utilitarian, but if you're a utilitarian, you want to add up uh, total utility, fine. You make it concave in income, you've got an argument against inequality. But even to, to a utilitarian, it's not that inequality is intrinsically undesirable. It's rather that it can be costly to a social welfare objective. And that's my position. That doesn't in any way mitigate the case for measuring and focusing on inequality. It just says there's a reason for that. Focus on the reason. Yeah, so I have a question then to, uh, because especially during recent 10 years, the global warming, in, during recent 10 years, yes. the global warming and climate change yeah. become a big concern. Mm -hmm. uh, and especially for the tropical countries, I mean, global warming might be, you know, 
might provide a barrier for them to, for people living in tropical countries to get rid, get out of poverty. Uh, because, I mean, global warming will destroy the water supply. Yeah, yeah. We will also, you know, we will reduce the supply of food, mm -hmm. for example. And uh, how do you think of this issue? I mean, and right. our economists, how do you think we can model global, uh, I mean, the global climate change into the poverty reductions? Uh, <laughs> well out of my yeah. comfort zone. Um, not that I've been within my comfort zone even this talk today, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> uh, but so, okay, I'll stay out of my comfort zone, I guess. Um, I, 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 my prior would be that uh, um, poor people will be probably amongst the, the, the biggest losers from uh, climate change. I'm appalled at the development community's lack of attention to adaptation. Um, it's starting to get a work, but you know, it was, a, it was a long process of delay. You know, we should be getting you know, Bangladesh, Vietnam, countries adapting. They've got a, there's a lot of things you've got to do ahead of this happening. And we know, you know, okay, we can we can still bet on on mitigation and hope, but don't don't rest poor people's lives on that. You know, there's going to have to be major population movements. There's going to be, have to be adaptation through in, in, in agriculture and production. That is, there are going to be big changes. I would, I'm, I'm, I'm personally quite alarmed at the lack of progress in that area. Um, it's really disturbing. We're starting to see, I'm not, I'm not exaggerating, we're certainly starting to see some good initiatives. And, and I think World Bank has been one of the more progressive uh, agencies in this respect. But I, I haven't seen the kind of attention from unilaterals and other agencies and, and groups that I would have liked to see. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, assuming that we can eliminate, eliminate um, extreme poverty, like the one dollar, yeah. li uh, li people living below the one dollar line. Do you think that afterwards we should concentrate on the next cohort, saying yeah. the ones living below five dollars? So, in other words, do you agree on this? That we should always concentrate on the minimum, on, yeah. the, on, the, on the people which live at the minimum relative to our current situation. Yeah, exactly. You think that this is like this? Exactly. Is, we have the same benefits regarding growth. Yeah, and, and that's also why I'm opposed to, to things like, you know, Land Pritchard talks about $10 a day poverty lines and all of this stuff. And I'm using rich world concepts of poverty in poor places. I think that's, that's silly, frankly. I mean, Land's a great guy and, 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 you know, it wasn't the first time he's been silly either. But, but you know, I don't know, it's unfair to criticise him. He's terrific. But those sorts of arguments, I, um, I don't know if you know about this debate, but there's a debate that says, why do we use poor countries' poverty lines? We should assess poverty in the world by the standards of rich countries. And you know, by that standard, 95% uh, of the population of India live below the US poverty line, yeah. right? And so it becomes irrelevant. It doesn't focus effort on the poorest. You know, I don't think the definition of the poorest is, is a questionable thing, but, but let's say you know, you're getting the right to the bottom of the distribution. We're not going to measure that very well anyway. Tails, we never measure it terribly well. But, but the idea that we should, uh, we have to start a, it's some sensible definition of the poorest in the world and work our way up. Uh, exactly. I also think that p poverty is fundamentally relative. But when we make our judgments and move into action, we're really going to have to still start with the poorest in the world and they should have the highest priority. Thank you. Yeah. I can. Thank you for the very interesting talk. Um, you ended it with a big question mark um, with regard to the slope of the future path, uh, if there will be another structural break or not, mm -hmm. and that we have to work to prevent another structural break. Um, so if you could decide for one day uh, what would be the, the most important thing to do uh, to prevent another structural break? Uh, I, don't, I don't think 
No, I, I can't answer that. Because I, I, I keep looking for the magic bullet and I keep not finding it. <laughs> and, and I kind of gave up. All, all I can say is that you take me to any country or people like me, you take me to any country, I will figure out what it is in that country. Right? And we will find whatever the barriers are, what are the constraints, what are the things that are holding back. And in one place it will be something quite different to another place. Um, you can do that and we can always figure it out, I think, as economists. You know? But don't start with that question. You know? What is that one thing that you will do? Well, the one thing I would do is figure out what the special thing is about each place that's holding back poverty reduction and work on that thing. And it's different. I mean, the, I work a lot in China and India, and I, I, my anti-poverty, ideal anti-poverty policies now in those two places would be, are very different. And they actually have been very different for a long time. They've changed within both places, but they're fundamentally different for 20 years. Yes? Thank you for this presentation. I enjoyed it a lot. Um, I think the discussion so far has focused on national policies. Um, can you say something about uh, the international aspects, mm -hmm. uh, trade barriers maybe, yeah. what, what you uh, think about? Well, I mean, um, yeah, I don't, trade barriers by and large don't help here, but I'm, I'm also not of the view that they're the first order issue, you know? So I, I'm not a, I don't think, even though I've worked for all those years, for 24 years for the World Bank, I actually don't think development aid is, is the, the first order issue in any sense. I, that's not why the world, places like the World Bank are important. It's not the money they give out, it's their ideas and it's the ability to convene and bring ideas from different places. Uh, and I've thought that for a long time. It's not the money. And, and it's not, that's even true now if you ask, well, what's the development, total development aid in the world as a percentage of the income of, de of developing countries? Take a guess in your heads. The answer is 1%. That 1% is, is you know, the expression, the tail doesn't wag the dog. Well, believe me, that 1% is not going to wag the dog. Now, in some countries, it's much more important, obviously. Trade is hugely important, but again, I'm not of the view that it's the driving force here. It's something you have to get right. You have to be more neutral on trade policy. And you certainly should remove trade biases against poor people. You, the, the, the irony of it is we've still got a biased trade regime against poor people. And moving those biases, getting to a much more neutral platform. But I don't see you know, trade as the major in engine of growth and poverty reduction. I think developing country policies, particularly in the social sectors, or education in particular, are going to be really, I think, they're really first order. Okay, that's, I would defend that in, in a longer discussion, but that's just my, my view, right? Um, and empirically, when I look at it, just, just like we said before about the magic bullet, if you ask that question, we've had countries where, where trade has, has, has helped, open, trade openness has helped in poverty reduction, and then we've got countries where it's hurt too. You know, it's an ambiguous thing. And that's not too surprising too, because when you think about it, trade policy is exactly one of those things where you're going to get horizontal impacts. Because net trading positions in commodity markets are obviously highly heterogeneous at a given level of income. I mean, you know, you've got urban poor who are net consumers of food and you've got rural poor, many of whom are net producers of food. So obviously a change in the price of food will, will have very heterogeneous impacts. And we see that across every trade reform we've ever studied. Gainers and losers at all levels. The average is out maybe to fairly little effect, but um, you know, the, the, it's, it's a part of the reason why I think it's not the first order issue. I think the first order issue is things like basic education, uh, removing constraints on technical innovation and the ability of people to innovate and, 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 and get access to credit and capital for doing that is a, is a first order thing. And that's why I've emphasized those things. We've got one more, maybe? Final one. Thanks. Um, you mentioned the conditional cash transfers that were popular in the 1990s or started yeah. getting popular there, and you mentioned the behavioral aspect of these conditional cash transfers. The which aspect? The conditional yeah, yeah. cash transfers, the behavioral aspect. Behavioral. So behavioral. behavioral. So that's, you, you should control the poor people, what they do with the money, and so yeah. on. Uh, now, in the last years, there's a big discussion about unconditional cash trans yeah. transfers. So just throw money at poor yeah. people, and whatever they do with it must be good. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? <laughs> 
Um, I think it's mainly p p politics that drives that question. I, I actually think the, the main motivation for CCTs is, is political. Um, I think it's a bit like, I, 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 I don't, as a general presumption, I think poor people know what's best for the, if, if they, if they, poor parents are not putting their kids and keeping their kids in school that long. I must, as an economist, imagine there's information they have that I don't have and the policymakers don't have, and I, I would respect that. The, so the philosophy of CCTs, in a sense, I'm, I'm a bit wary of. Right? And also when I think about it in the history of thought, I've become wary too, because it is premised on a view that uh, behavioral change is going to be is key. You penalize certain behaviors. That's the idea of CCTs. Um, Alfred Marshall also had an idea of that, but he, was, he, he, he said you should punish parents for not sending their kids to school. Whereas the CCT idea is you should reward them for sending their kids to school. But still, you've got to believe that the behavioral change is, is important. So at the same, I, can, I fully accept credit market arguments and so on, although I don't think they, they necessarily imply CCT. Credit market phase, that poor parents can't afford to borrow from the future income that the kids will make to put them in school. I think that's all perfectly valid. That's a crucial part of why poverty persists. That is, there is definitely poverty traps associated with education. I think CCTs can help that under certain circumstances, but I'm a bit wary, and I would be instinctively, in most settings, more inclined to go for unconditional transfers. And I think they can be very much important part of redistributive policy everywhere. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you.